Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 165 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is distinguished faculty, Dr. Jahangir John Usgar from the Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute, Florida, United States. Dr. Usgar is a spine surgeon, bringing over 18 years of quality care and experience to the Cantor Spine Center at the Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The center, Dr. Usgar sees clinical research, ultrasonic and robotic technologies for adult and pediatric scoliosis. His particular interest lies in the treatment of patients of all ages with scoliosis and complex deformities of the spine. Dr. Asgar utilizes cutting edge technologies while treating his patients using a unique holistic approach. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Jahangir John Asgar for this fantastic live program. Over to you, John. Hello guys, thank you very much. So uh, today we're gonna to talk about something that's garnered a lot of interest for me. And, and it's relatively new to me. It's about three to four months old, but it's been a big part of my practice. And it's, uh, it's grown pretty quickly. And it's, uh, uh, especially in the deformity realm, I think there's a lot of utility to this. And it's doing lateral lumbar inner body fusions, X lifts, O lifts, D lifts in the, from the prone position. So basically we're gonna kind of go over the talk um, and, the, and then what is the procedure? So the X lift, remember, is a procedure that's usually traditionally done in a lateral decubitus position, okay? Um, the nice thing about the X lift is it keeps us out of the uh, uh, posterior musculature. We're able to put large, inner body grafts in without doing a traditional anterior operation. Um, uh, with neuromonitoring, we're able to um, safely traverse the lumbar plexus when we do it. Uh, and, you know, we, there is this also this idea of, of um, achieving indirect decompression by utilizing uh, the principles of ligament ataxis. So, What's the, what's the reason we would do it in the prone position, right, is um, basically it's the concept in the U.S., which has grown pretty quickly, is the idea of single position surgery. So being able to do basically a front back operation without ever having to do the flip. And I think that's a big part of, of efficiency and actually improving patient care and outcome. And we can talk about the the issues with prolonged anesthesia. So ultimately we want to kind of understand the, the issues around why we would do something and what are the disadvantages. And it's always good to start with the disadvantages. And in this case, remember, um, because we are prone, uh, there are some different issues that we arise around and we have to navigate around. And so the ergonomics, how you sit, because you're sitting in the angle that the patient's at is a little bit awkward. So your head is tilted up a little bit. And so the ergonomics sometimes aren't the best. Instead of trying to work up, sometimes I'll work to the side and have my head to the side, which actually is a little bit ergonomically better and makes it easier for my eye line and eyesight to, to tolerate. At all four or five, you, you know, uh, the issues of breaking the table become a concern. Um, I've been able to navigate that around uh, uh, how I plan my incision and having it a little more anterior, more of the anti psoas approach at times at four or five, which works quite well. Um, but you just have to be prepared for that ahead of surgery because occasionally um, uh, if you plan for the incision through the wrong spot, you're going you're gonna to have difficulty. Um, the, you still can't get to L5 S1 through this approach. Um, so for me, L5 S1 still in this approach tends to be a traditional, uh, uh, PLIF or TLIF. Um, the other part of it is, um, uh, gravity is uh, your friend, but it also, because it lordoses the spine, but it also um, puts a little bit of extra pressure that the retractor sees 
um, that you're not used to. And so you, it's something you have to manage. And then some of the other things, you know, with uh, sectioning the ALL, uh, what would happen if we were to do that in this case? And I would tell you right now, uh, there are very few indications where I feel like I need to section the ALL and I'm usually able to achieve pretty darn good lordosis without that. And so I pretty am pretty comfortable with the idea of just no need for, for a, 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 a resection of the ALL in these cases, at least at the moment. The advantages, it's single position surgery, right? So where I'm able to do access the front of the spine, like a traditional axe lift or anterior surgery from the prone position. And that has a lot of advantages in the sense that you have a large graft. Um, you can really restore the height really well. You can do a very good anulotomy and discectomy. Um, and then you can do more work in certain ways through the inner, bot, inner space, and that helps. Uh, the, it allows us to mobilize the spine better because oftentimes my workflow tends to be a posterior first where I put my screws in. I tend to use what, what are called modular screws, have the screws, um, do my osteotomies, which makes the spine very supple, and then come back and do my disc work. And this allows me to mobilize the spine maximally with, uh, before doing anything that is, uh, uh, that's gonna uh, uh, corrective. And I think that really makes it uh, a very nice tool to have. Um, it's actually, uh, uh, in terms of positioning wise, um, the other nice thing of a, is gravity kind of tends to pull the abdominal contents away from you and down. So once you get comfortable with working in that in that frame of space, the uh, it's quite easy to uh, stay very safe. Um, I utilize navigation. We'll talk about the benefits of that in a little bit, uh, which makes it even safer and it gives you a lot of other information, which makes it super accessible and uh, quick and efficiency. Um, and then again, when you have revision surgery, right? Oftentimes um, in revision surgery where you have to do osteotomies or take down fusion masses, um, then you end up doing essentially a back front back type of operation if you needed any inner body cages or you stay out of the anterior space because of the fact that it's too, it, it makes it difficult to get in because it's so many parts. So here, basically I'm able to take the instrumentation out all at one time, re-instrument, do my osteotomies and then do my inner body work and uh, come back and put the rods in all in one setting as opposed to, to breaking it up in separate setting or breaking it up into separate stages. So kind of the tips and pearls of the procedure. Number one, uh, I firmly believe that this is a, a uh, procedure that is best done under navigation just because the, it removes the floral component. It, it removes it from the uh, uh, from your way, and it ends up actually making the workflow a lot easier. It's reliable. The navigation actually allows you to develop very good angles, and um, it's actually quite safe in conjunction with the neuromonitoring. Um, it allows me the freedom to, to work in many different ways. So I, I have, you know, I can adjust fire very quickly, meaning I can kind of decide on what I want to do and working adjacent levels and do more posterior work when I, where I need to and less posterior work where I need to and not worry about what's going to happen when I flip the patient. Um, you want to make sure in these cases that the ASIS pad is a little lower than what you traditionally have it. Um, and I have a broader pad there, um, usually just to, to lessen the risk of a lateral femoral cutaneous issue. Um, and I haven't knock on wood run into one, but that's one of those things where uh, it is important to, to be uh, cognizant that your pad position around your hips is a little bit lower. Um, 
the the views that are most important when you're using utilizing navigation we'll kind of go through this in some images is a synthetic lateral image and your axial and chronal images and the reason those are most important is they give you the best frame of reference of not only angle into the disc anterior posterior relationship of the disc and then um, also uh, the uh, the head to tail angulation of uh, of your instruments that needs to be to make sure you're getting across and releasing all the osteophytes and everything that you need to do to, to, to do a good release. Um, the other aspect of it, it's really important to have your Jackson table on the highest setting. So right now, a lot of times I'll keep it on, when I'm doing posterior only work, I'll keep it on the lowest rung. And if you don't have it on the highest setting, then you're quite scooching down to do a lot of your work. So basically, uh, when would I use the XF prone as it grows to be a bigger and uh, more uh, uh, regular part of my uh, workflow? It's in most cases that are two to five. Anything that I really need significant A lift type of work for five one, uh, the XF prone probably isn't the best operation for that. That I would probably do uh, a lateral A lift at five one, and then traditional XFs or traditional lateral lumbar and or body fusions, whether they're anti psoas or through the psoas, all two to five, um, just because then I'm you are already in that position. Where does it really make uh, a lot of uh, sense? It's for your long construct deformities because you're, you're utilizing uh, uh, gravity to help you obtain the sagittal plane. And it, unlike a T lift where you're pass or a plif where you have to pass it by the neural elements, distract open a little bit to get the cage in or use these smaller expandable cages, which don't take a, uh, give you this larger footprint. Now you've got this large, nice large footprint where you can need the combination of a direct decompression and an indirect decompression, right? I mean, where you need it more of a de direct decompression uh, along with the indirect decompression you get from the cage um, is another nice place to get it. And again, for complex revisions, and that's the majority of my practice falls into that where people have had multiple previous operations, previous non-unions, their the, the ability to, to fuse posterior laterally in some ways compromised so, so I use this quite a bit in that sense. Uh, where is an X lift, traditional X lift contraindicated? It's uh, vascular anatomy is one. Uh, ret retroperitoneal scarring is another. Uh, degenerative spinal anesthesis greater than grade two. Okay. Um, and, and some of that with the ability to do prone lateral surgery is a little bit different. And we can talk to that a little bit going forward. If your facets are locked posteriorly, traditionally, you did not uh, use do, do lateral surgery because you really couldn't get the body in post or the, the inner space, uh, the cage in laterally and open that space up because everything was locked posteriorly. Um, nowadays, you, what I would do in those cases is I just generally, uh, uh, do a posterior column osteotomy, release the posterior lock, and then do the 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 prone X lift for a spinal anesthesis. Since I have my instrumentation in, I'll gradually and slowly reduce the spinal anesthesis to create more space to be able to put the uh, the the cage in a more optimal position. So so those can be done in different ways. So the degenerative spinal anesthesis traditionally you didn't really do greater than grade two. Uh, which I've done now and it works quite well. And it's a conjunction of working posterior and anterior simultaneously. And then the locked facets, you want to traditionally, because you couldn't open the space, you wouldn't do. But now with the ability to do posterior osteotomies and work anteriorly at the same time, um, it makes it easier to do as well. L5S1 is, is the issue, right? Like it'd be nice to be able to get a large A lift type graft in L5S1 right now um, that. Uh, that capacity is not present. Uh, there are ways that we're thinking about doing it. And so, so we're a little bit far away from doing that now, but I think ultimately, so the safest thing is, is just this, you're not gonna be able to access 5.1 with this. At 4.5, you just need to be careful of where the crest is. 
you can do a crest line approach, but I wouldn't do that as a uh, as an initial exposure because you don't want to run into a place where you're not comfortable. Positioning wise, standard positioning, uh, you can tape these patients down securely uh, in the chest and the hip because you don't want them to slop around too much. I'm not that big a taper, uh, but some of the other, uh, like Dr. Uribe out of the Barrow and uh, 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 several other people uh, prefer to tape a little bit more. Uh, but I think, uh, I think if you secure them well, um, it just makes everything easier. So, so I do, I do, I think the idea of taping them out down is at least early on for you guys is a, probably a good idea. The rest of the procedure then starts to fall very much into a uh, traditional X lift, meaning you need to make sure you have a good solid AP and a good solid lateral. Remember, if you're going to utilize uh, uh, fluoro, uh, your fluoroscopic landmarks are critical. And this procedure can't be done safely by cutting that corner. So, so making sure that prior to positioning, the patient, you have a perfect AP, a, a pretty good lateral. Um, in degenerative scoliosis, often like the what is pictured here on the right, it is uh, usually you'll have one that is lined up and the other one that is rotated a little bit more. That's okay. Um, you just pick the, the, I tend to pick the, the caudal one to be a perfect AP. And then if the one above it is a little rotated, I accept that fact, but I make a mental note of it. Um, and when you use navigation, you'll find that a lot of that, uh, th those issues and concerns actually go away. Um, and the, uh, here, this is what really allows you to get into the disc space. So at this point in time, once you've taped them in position, when you brought in, you got your perfect AP and your perfect lateral, then it very much falls into an excellent approach. The issue here becomes for me is when you use a lot of fluoro, like in this particular case, the fluoro fluoroscopic imaging actually gets in your way. The, the, the intensifier uh, is a roadblock for you to, to work around and you can do so, but it's just not comfortable work around. And especially it may be as less of an issue when you have a single level case, but when you start having multiple level cases, uh, an open posterior aspect, the, the issues of navigating around a, or uh, working around the fluoro machine becomes uh, prohibitive. Um, just like with a traditional x you want to draw out your lines. Uh, you want to make sure you identify the trajectory of the disc, the midpoint of the body. Um, I'll also draw out an anterior uh, a line uh, for where the anterior body is and anterior aspect of the body is, and the posterior aspect of the body is. So in my mind's eye, I have made a corridor, a working corridor, which I will be working into. And that makes it quite easy. That's what the way I do a traditional lateral lumbar as well, because that working corridor mentally, your incision is there. And it also, what I also will have done is because I like always to work in the horizon, I don't want to be off and you'll see other people may do it in slightly different trajectories. I feel like working in the horizon is, is uh, the safest way. So I usually have my, uh, my uh, rep at the bottom of the table to ensure that we are uh, working appropriately horizontal to the, uh, to the ground. And that way, if my cob or my instruments are off setter, they're able to recognize that pretty quickly and just keep me well aligned. The, uh, this is where navigation starts to, to, to really come into play for me. So the beauty of navigation in this sense is I still secure them down a lot, but at this point in time, I don't worry too much about the rotation because a lot of my patients have had previous lamectomy, previous fusions, previous this, previous that. So it makes it quite difficult to be able to get into uh, uh, getting a perfect lateral or perfect imaging. So, so 
what I'm able to do is I plan my incisions actually utilizing the uh, navigation. Um, so once I've done my posterior work, you'll see that I have a spinous process clamp. I usually put the spine, if I'm doing multiple levels, I'll put the, the spinous process clamp at the level I'm uh, uh, working or adjacent to the level I'm working because even then if there's any subsidence or movement of that body. So if we're working at L3 the and four, the spinous process clamp will go at L3 or L4, depending on um, um, how I get my want to get my screws in, but I'll put it there. So even if it subsides or the body of L3 moves, then the end plate of L3 moves and my navigation still stays relatively accurate. Um, I've played with the idea of doing it off of a uh, iliac crest, which is what you see on the uh, right there. And uh, I found that that isn't quite as accurate as when you do it off of the, uh, the spinous process. So I'm a, I'm a, for me, when I navigate, I, I very much prefer off of the spinous process for these because it stays just very much more accurate because over time, especially if you do more posterior work first, which is usually my workflow, the everything subsides and falls a little bit forward. And really to make sure that that doesn't happen, uh, it's important to, to uh, uh, and it, or, or if it does that you account for it being on the, on the vertebrae that you're working, it makes it uh, uh, much safer. So the first thing we want to do is confirm trajectory. Here, it is very much similar to what you do with a uh, a uh, uh, with the C arm. So I confirm the midpoint. I confirm my trajectory. I make sure I have a posterior line, a, a posterior. Uh, identify the posterior aspect of the vertebral body the anterior aspect of the vertebral body, and I want to make sure I've got a nice direct shot at it. Um, sometimes when I'm working multiple levels, um, I'll create more of a vertical incision, just be able to kind of work that multiple level angle. That's kind of how I look at it. What you will find here is the muscle dissection when you go prone is a little bit different than the muscle dissection when you go lateral. Um, because of the way the muscles fall forward with your, with your lateral and the muscles actually your external obliques your uh, transverse abdominal muscles your internal obliques tend to be um, thinned out they tend to be stretched out a little bit um, in this case they actually tend to bunch up a little bit so going through each muscle layer is actually more work than what you'll realize so the first time you do it this is something Dr. Uh, uh, Uribe had pointed out to me was that you're going to run into uh, more muscle than you anticipate before you fall in the retroperitoneal space, which if you don't realize that's going to happen, it can be a little bit disconcerting. So that, that's the nice thing. And so, sometimes what I will do is because I'm going through more muscle, especially early on where I always worry about, am I going in the right trajectory? I always will bring my, my tracker in to confirm trajectory while I'm going through as well. Once I am through the muscle, the next thing I usually do is do what, what I call a retroperitoneal sweep. And I probably should add a couple slides in here. But I feel from uh, TP to TP of the level, I'm feeling that I sweep, turn my finger posteriorly, I, I, up facing posteriorly, do a retroperitoneal sweep and palpate the, the, uh, the transverse process of let's say if I'm working at L3 and L4, palpate the transverse process of three, palpate the transverse process of four, start to feel the psoas sweep down to the front of the psoas. Now I have kind of created an open corridor. At this point in time, I'll use like a, a, a lighted Wiley or a lighted Thompson type of retractor and put that in to be able to, to retract everything forward or um, the other thing I'll do is if I'm very comfortable with the position, I'll put two fingers in and I'll put the, keep the two fingers ventral to prevent poking anything that's uh, uh, intraperitoneal and then pass the, the uh, uh, dilators over my, or the initial dilator, the, the tracker over my finger. What this basically does is uh, gives me a safe corridor to work into. 
if you see the yellow line, I've, I've got this extension that I, the, with the navigation that we, they draw out that extends out 15 to 20 millimeters. And that just kind of makes sure that I'm going down the right path. The other thing you can't, you can see here is you can actually make out the SOAS. That's actually quite nice uh, because sometimes I can easily work anti SOAS because the trajectory is there. And here you saw that the SOAS is a bit, we're at the four or five space. The SOAS is a little bit bigger. My ability to retract that SOAS dorsally from a lot, strict lateral positions a little harder. So, so I decided to go more trans SOAS with that. The other approach is sometimes what I'll do is I'll run the, uh, uh, especially if they don't have that large, what we call the Mickey Mouse ears, I'll run the uh, dilator a little bit anterior and then retract dorsally on the psoas with the dilator before I penetrate into the, uh, the disc space. Again, these are different uh, ways to do it. I work kind of all across. I like a stiff dilator. I'm not a big key wire user. So I end up using the dilator to go into the disc space. And what that does for me is it centralizes me into the disc. Right, so so it because the the it creates a small corridor. If I have a long um, uh, device that's going through that corridor, the the uh, when I put the retractors over, it'll help keep the retractors better centered, and as opposed to being off to the head or the tail. And that's one of the benefits of kind of going into the disc space with your dilator. Um, Traditionally, when uh, say uh, Nuvasiv teaches it, they want you to go to the disc uh, level and then pass in a guide wire and then stimulate around the original dilator. Um, it's very rare for me to ever have a low reading on that first stimulator. So I just, I, that's one of the other reasons I prefer. So when you're taught with through say Nuvasiv or some other company, it's usually through the disc or, or it's a guide wire. Uh, for me, I just don't think the guide wire makes sense in my practice. And I still do the, the stimulation, but I usually do it on the second and third dilator. Again, I do the traditional neuro uh, neuromapping. Um, at the other part of that, though, is it is important to recognize that uh, uh, anatomy matters here. So, so um, Depending on where you are, the uh, the as you work from L2, L3, L4, and L5, the uh, lumbar plexus tends to to drift more forward. So if you're at the 50 yard line, uh, in most cases you're pretty good, uh, but the at L4, 5 is where you can really run into issues. And sometimes what I'll do is again, I'll even if I go trans so as I'll start a little more anterior, and then as I get to the disc. I'll actually uh, gently retract up and move my uh, dilator more dorsal because I'm doing it almost under direct vision and then lock it in. And that actually keeps me out of a lot of trouble. The other thing you'll notice is I keep the hips pretty extended. And what that does to the psoas, it actually draws the psoas back. So it's your psoas actually doesn't sit as far forward when the hips are extended. And, uh, knock on wood, I haven't had any thigh issues with that. I've had one patient with uh, uh, thigh issues and she had a, uh, she was a congenital hemivertebrae with a pretty complex uh, lumbar plexus, which I had to navigate through. I ended up putting a, 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 a traditional T-lift in, in her in the neutral position. That all resolved over a course of a couple of weeks, but the, but that was, uh, the one time I had it, and that was more because I think the anatomy she had. And so I actually ended up uh, backing off a traditional x lift implant for her and going in with a uh, 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 more a, a neutral shaped uh, t lift implant. Again, I'm very quick to uh, confirm trajectory. So even with the dilators on, uh, once I'm happy, I'm in the disc space, I like my trajectory, I very quickly will put on the, the tracker uh, just to make sure that I am going down the right path um, because it is, it is a little bit different. Your hand can, does want to move around a little bit. And then that's the other reason it's nice to be 
Uh, if you can see the image here, it's nice to be actually in the disk space because it keeps you better centered. But I always double check um, after every step of where I did. And the nice thing is, is it's not a fluoro double check. It's just putting the tracker on and taking the tracker off. So I don't have to bring fluoro in. Fluoro is not in my way. My assistant usually sits on the other side of the table, just like she is right now, and making it very convenient and easy for me to work. Uh, then what we end up doing is placing the retractor down. Um, what you will find is traditionally, if you have a, uh, a patient that uses like a 12 millimeter or 12 centimeter retractor, it's going to be a 14. So everything gets a little bit longer. And that's one of the, the rate limiting steps of prolateral surgery is, is the distances are a little bit more because the way the gravity doesn't allow the, the sides to fall and thin out the, the, the flanks as much. So understanding that you're gonna have further distances is really important. And so if, you use, if you're used to using a 12, you're gonna be using a 14. If you're used to using a 14, you may be using a 16. If you're used to using a 16, or this particular patient is a 16, um, on a lateral position, it may more be an 18 than you think. And where that becomes important is a lot of the retractors lengths, especially with like nuvasives of uh, lateral retractors are uh, max out at 18 millimeters. So you want, or 18 centimeters. So you want to make sure that your patients aren't too large for this. And so, so there is a patient selection issue ahead of time. So I usually will measure out that lateral space and make sure that I'm not picking somebody who's too big for it. Uh, the other aspect of is, is once you've, uh, put the retractors in, uh, the, uh, the dilators in, you're comfortable with everything. You want to, uh, I'll take the, the shin or the, the, uh, retract or the retractor. I'll place the retractor. Um, and I place it just like you would for an, uh, an X lift where the shim is posterior and the blades are the anterior blades are anterior. Um, and then very, uh, it's very, very important to use the shim in these cases because of the sag. What'll happen is retractors right now aren't stiff enough. And what they do do want to do is sag. So it is, I traditionally in my excellent never really, because I would move, uh, oftentimes when I do it, it ended up being more than one level. And so I just, it'd be quicker for me not to use the shim, but in the, in the prone, it's really important to use the shim because of that sag issue. Um, it's also important to stim before you put the shim in because you don't want to impale something that you don't realize is there. Okay. Then everything else ends up being the exact same. And so you, I have got special instruments that I sure track that are extra long. Uh, you noticed how Alexa, uh, my PA, is actually st stabilizing the retractor arm because of the fact that right now, the retractor arms aren't stiff enough. Um, so even though I have a shim in, um, even though I have a shim in, I have her uh, stabilizing the retractor arm. I have special long cobs with uh, sure track devices that allow me to get in uh, to the uh, space pretty safely. Everything else from here on is a standard old uh, 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 XLIF or lateral interbody. The beauty of this is I know exactly where my vessels are. I know exactly what trajectory I'm going in. I know, and I'm. it's pretty accurate to release the contralateral annulus. And it's very much not reliant on making sure, you know, like rotation and the issues that sometimes come up with fluoro nav or fluoro go completely away. You do your traditional discectomy. All of this work um, I do with nav, in this particular case, we're showing off with fluoro. And it is no different than what your traditional work tends to be. Once you do your discectomy, um, uh, I wish we had better pictures, but uh, it is it is very much a a lateral lumbar inner body fusion type of case. Your view is the exact same. Your impressions are the exact same. Everything kind of works the same way. Uh, this is a, a funny case where we ran into issues because I brought the arm I, in the in the wrong uh, side. So I usually bring the arm in from the other side with navigation. If you bring the arm in this way, 
uh, you can't see it, but the navigation was on the bottom. So uh, it, it got in the way, but I still uh, will trial with uh, uh, fluoro and I won't do a lateral because I'm pretty comfortable with the A to P relationship, but I wanna make sure I get the right size cage in to make sure that we get the optimal indirect decompression. So I'll just have fluoro come in for two seconds uh, when I'm doing the trial and the implant. Again, this is more images of the trial, navigate it out. And then I do the cage placement, this I do, essentially under direct vision. Um, and again, this is also done under uh, 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 flora. The nice thing about uh, the procedure is I can generate a whole lot of lordosis with this. Um, and and uh, in patients where traditionally I was thinking PSOs, I was thinking different osteotomies. Um, the combination of a simple posterior column osteotomy and an aggressive discectomy and lateral inner body fusion with hyperlordotic cages uh, it does it. Patients who've had CSF leaks, who have pseudomeningocetes, um, those issues, right? I can still do the posterior lateral decompression work and do my foraminotomies and release the spine, but stay out really stay out of all of that mess posteriorly, especially if they develop a non in that area and do my work uh, uh, anteriorly. Um, the other thing is, is I'm not passing a large uh, graft or uh, things, instruments by too much by the, the nerve roots. And so that aspect is, is very, very nice for me and to be really be able to do that very quickly and efficiently without changing positions without thing. Now, ultimately, everybody's workflow is different. And so that's where, for me, in my practice, because of the long uh, constructs, the, the osteotomies, the, there's just, um, it tends to be posterior first releases, making the spine very supple, coming, actually the posterior first, which includes placing my screws, and I use uh, uh, modular screws do my osteotomy and releases and my posterior decompression, which makes the spine very supple. Then I come in and do my lateral inner bodies. And then I go back and do my uh, posterior rods. And again, the nature of my practice of being revision that works by the time I'm done um, with the posterior work and the lateral discectomy and then putting my lateral inner bodies in, the spine is, is super free to move in just about any trajectory I want. It allows me to be very aggressive in terms of correcting the sides plane. Thank you guys. Um, any questions or concerns? Thank you, John, for that fantastic presentation. Really cutting edge. And I think this, this is just up, upcoming, isn't it? I mean, there are few, only very few surgeons around the world doing it. And I'm really happy that you're one of those. A uh, few questions. Uh, actually, John, you can stop sharing the screen so we can see yep. each other. I mean. uh, yes, that's fine. It. Yeah, it's okay. Fine. That's okay. Uh, see, John, you're approaching from the lateral side, isn't it? So yes. Is there a risk for a visceral injury? Because we are going purely minimally invasive. And I, I know that navigation really picks all the bony parts. But what about the soft tissue? We really don't see that, isn't it? No, you do. And that's, uh, and that's the thing is like, if you look back at the uh, CAT scan, and I, uh, do you mind if I share the screen one more no, time? Yeah, I've, no, no, I remember, I have seen, I, I remember the picture. Yeah, so, so what you do is you actually see a lot of your visceral contents quite well. You see your psoas quite well. So I'm not only looking on the navigation. I'm not only looking at the bony aspect. The bony aspect is just one thing. I am very much paying attention to my where my uh, uh, artery is, where uh, the psoas sits, and then also the, the abdominal contents because they do show, the shadows of them show quite well. And if you are thoughtful about it, you're able to see that very nicely. And so it's just, it's just 
uh, it's additive. Now, is it as good as, as other things, but it's better than fluoro. Fluoro is a bit of a guess, right? When we do the lateral position. So I see it quite well. And I'm very cognizant of where it is the whole time. And, and so, so, so when I look at a CAT scan, um, I'm actually planning for that ahead of time now, as opposed to with the way I was before. And so you upload this CAT scan earlier, isn't it? Yeah. So we have an interoperative CAT scanner. So that's, that's, so as soon as I do the posterior exposure, I'll put the spinous process clamp on and uh, put my screws in. Then I do my, uh, or do my, put my spinous process clamp on, do my interoperative CT uh, and then put my screws in because screws require the most accuracy, the lowest error rate of anything we do there. Um, with the navigating the anterior space, a millimeter or two actually is is okay because you're able to 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 visually kind of make up for the differences and it's usually not off when it's off a millimeter or two it's not off in trajectory it's usually off in distances so and again from a lateral interspace perspective the distances matter less it's trajectory that matters more so it keeps you pretty safe that way so I think uh, one of the prerequisites should be an intraoperative CM, I mean, fluoro, isn't it? Or do you think you can just uh, rely on the navigation? I'm sorry, one more time. No, you need to have an intraoperative. You, you, you skipped for a second. Need, yeah, we need to have an intraoperative CT scan, isn't it? As a prerequisite. Do you think that's a prerequisite? Uh, you need, you need to have a form of navigation that allows you to do that. So there's different, like 70 uh, surgical has a uh, mechanism to navigate preoperatively. Um, and then it uh, allows you to uh, uh, utilize that in an intraoperative sense. And it's very accurate. So as long as you have, um, for the traditional 3D navs, most of them now require an intraoperative CT. Uh, so companies like 70 Surgical, which are uh, where, where it allows you to register intraoperatively off of the CT you did in a preoperative sense, is a little bit different. So what I would say to you is, is it it uh, at the moment? Yes. In the near future, right? And it's already available, but in the near future, as it becomes more ubiquitous, you can do it with your off of your preoperative CT. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, there's a lot of talk about the oblique lumbar interbody fusion, isn't it? Olive. Yes. So Olive. what is the trend? So what do you, do you do that? And do you see an advantage for that? Or what are the indications for that? So uh, Olive and Exlif are brands. So I, I would probably not, uh, I think the words we want to probably use is being anterior to psoas versus uh, trans psoas. Um, I am very uh agnostic between the two so what i would say to you is i'm not a, a uh atp -er or a trans psoas -er in, in in the traditional sense um, a lot of times the anatomy dictates what i can get to so i like being atp and when it's easy for me to do it uh i tend to, to do that and so uh about 75 to 80 percent of my cases i can go atp um the trans psoas approach really is uh, for uh, situations where the anatomy precludes me from doing it. And in those cases, it's usually there's a, a large uh, psoas muscle, which extends much beyond the vertebral body. So at L4-5, sometimes that can be so large that, that um, I usually call it, you have to kind of chop off of uh, the top of Mickey Mouse's ears. So you kind of go through the top portion of the psoas and go and do a trans psoas approach. Um, so, so I like the ATP approach. I think it's a super solid approach. In most cases, I like doing it. If you're going to do any sort of ALL resection or do more corpectomy work, um, the OLIF or the trans or anterior to psoas approach is the safer, more appropriate approach for that. Um, Trans uh, psoas uh, is really good for, uh, because being ATP throws you off of the orthogonal. And so you can become very disoriented if you're not experienced at it. 
And so, so the nice thing about a trans psoas approach, especially for uh, younger or newer surgeons, is it maintains your orthogonal. And so, so your concerns about visceral content injury or vascular injury or the um, your implant ending up in the contralateral foramen because of the trajectory of the implant is uh, is lessened by that. So what I would say to you is, I I am I I prefer being anterior to psoas, uh, but in certain instances, trans psoas is the right way to go about it. And the instrumentation is totally different for all of us, isn't it? Uh, not a, not as much. <laughs> Actually, you can kind of do it with both. So I'm I'm relatively like uh, so the 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 so traditionally with Olaf, they have a fixed cage which you what you do what we they call it an orthogonalized maneuver, which you do it and after you start to get the cage in, you bring it up into the orthogonal position. Uh, they also have a uh, cage that is has a pivoting aspect. It's called the pivx, and that allows you to pivot the cage into it. Um, uh, and it just depends on what the anatomy allows. So, but in most instances, the 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 the, the implants aren't all that much different. And when you compare with the ALIF, uh, for example, if you want to compare with the ALIF and the XLIF, can we say that the ALIF is at more risk for vascular and the XLIF has a risk for neurological injuries? Can we make a comparison? I, I think I think the yeah. So I mean, a traditional ALIF, you're usually working at the five one inner space, or you're working at four five and five one, um, and yeah, you you are working more around the vasculature in those cases. And so the potential for vasculature injury is higher. Um, in the uh, lateral lumbar or the XLIF approach, uh, you're working around the lumbar plexus, right? And so, so that's where the neuromodulary, but the, the data around that is actually quite good. But you can also run into vascular injuries if you're off of the orthogonal, right? If you're off of the orientation. So that's, again, where... Where I like the navigation is because I always know I'm orthogonal and I can always make a very rapid adjustment to the orthogonal. Where uh, with fluoro, if especially in degenerative deformity, if there's rotation, it, sometimes it's hard to tell and you can run into problems. So there are incidents of vascular injuries from, from X-lips or lateral lumbar endovati fusions. Uh, okay, Jang, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you for joining. It was really a fantastic session. A lot of cutting edge work and really glad to see the kind of work you're doing at the Orthopedic Institute in Florida. Congratulations thank and you thank you much. very much. Okay. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.